Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. The topic of today's video is the law of conservation of energy. Uh, now we've already mentioned this a number of times in the course, but now we're officially using it to make some specific calculations. So this is uh, actually a very important concept in science, one of the most important, uh, certainly up there with Newton's laws, in fact, maybe more important. Uh, so I want you to pay very close attention as we go through this. You're going to learn a very powerful method of making calculations which can be surprisingly simple. Uh, some of the questions that we're going to answer specifically are how to use this idea, the law of conservation of energy, to deal with some of the forms of energy we've been learning so far, such as gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy, and we're going to bring in the concept of work. So in a moment I'd like you to pause the video, take a look at where we are in the unit schedule, as well as what the learning goals and success criteria are, then come back and we'll get started. Okay, and you're back. We're going to dive right into things by taking a look first at a really interesting or dramatic uh, example of the law of conservation of energy. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to jump to the Wikipedia page on the law of conservation of energy where there is a video embedded and it looks like it comes from another website called physicsworks.ogg. I've never actually been there, but this is a great video that I'd like you to watch. A professor from a university is going to do a demonstration of the law of conservation of energy in front of his lecture. So without further ado, let's have a look at that video. He is here and uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to mute the sound here because I'll do the narration. Okay. Uh, he lets go of a ball which swings like a pendulum and just barely misses his chin. You can see it doesn't hit him, and if I rewind this just a little bit, let's see if we can't find him, do it, see where he does this again. Watch one more time. He holds a ball. He actually tells you in the video this is a 15 kilogram, so more than 30 pounds, steel ball. And uh, as you can see, it swings quite fast. If this were to hit him in the head, it could cause some serious injury. I mean, it might not kill him, but it would certainly, uh, he could chip some teeth, he might break his jaw. Let's watch what happens one more time. He lets go of the ball, and here we go. You see the ball swinging away, picking up speed, then slowing down and just missing his chin. So, obviously a dramatic example of something. Uh, what's it got to do with the law of conservation of energy? Let's have a look. I've drawn a little diagram here of what's going on and I've written in that the mass is 15 kilograms. Now the numbers that I've used are um, maybe not the exact numbers from the video, but they're probably uh, realistic numbers. I'm going to assume that at the beginning, when the speed of the ball is zero, he's holding the ball roughly at his head, which if he is uh, five foot something adult male, probably around 1.8 meters, so let's assume that's how high the ball is in the beginning. Now he lets go, and as you saw in the video, the ball picks up speed, and then it reaches the bottom of its swing, where it's maybe, I don't know, let's guess a meter above the ground, and then it swings back up, and it stops here. And then of course it reverses direction uh, on its way back, picking up speed, and then slowing down as it climbs back up. Now in the video, he tells you that as long as he doesn't give the ball a push at the beginning, then it will swing and come back and not hit him. Let's look at the energies that are involved here. First of all, at the very beginning, the ball has no speed, therefore its kinetic energy is equal to zero. And of course the ball is 1.8 meters above the ground, so we could argue that it has gravitational energy, which of course would be mgh. Now the ball swings down to this low point here and because this is the lowest point in the problem I have the right to make this the place where eg is equal to zero. So here's what I'm going to do. Even though the height is one meter above the ground because I see this is the lowest point in the problem I'm going to make this zero. You can do this. Remember we talked about the reference point for eg. You can set it wherever you want, and it's a good idea to set it somewhere, the lowest point in the problem usually, because that makes the math easier. Now if that becomes zero, then this automatically becomes not 1.8, but 0.8 meters. So you have to make sure you make that change. 
Now the ball swings down to the bottom and if you go back and watch the video, it's moving very fast over here. How fast is it moving? I don't know, so the speed is a question mark, but I do know that if the height is zero, then the EG is also zero. Now what makes this so dramatic is you, you, your, you, your mind uh, remembers how fast the ball is going here and you forget that when the ball swings back up, it's going to slow down, obviously. Everything, anything thrown up is going to slow down. But your mind tricks you into thinking that maybe it's going to hit him at this speed. So when you have that thought in your mind, you have this, uh, this, this uh, suspense, and it's a very dramatic demonstration. Well, let's, uh, let's find out actually how fast this ball was moving when it got to the bottom. How could we do it? Well, according to the law of conservation of energy, which, by the way, in my class, I like to call L-O-C-O-E, or sometimes I call it LOCO. I don't know if anyone else does this, but I do. Uh, this tells us that the total amount of energy at any given point in the problem, so let's say E total initial, is equal to E total final. This is what the law says. It's basically telling you that the total amount of energy is constant. Energy can't be created or destroyed. So I'm left to choose what is going to be my initial point. Well, I'm going to make that the starting point here. So let's call this the initial. And remember what the question was that I just asked you is how fast is the ball moving down here? So I'm going to call this the final point. All right, so what do we do next? The word total means add up everything that there is. So what forms of energy are involved here? Well, clearly there's EG. We've talked about that. So we're going to have EG initial. And what other forms of energy? There's movement. So we're going to have E kinetic initial. And are there any other forms of energy involved? The answer is probably yes. For example, there'll be some air resistance. However, there's not a lot of air resistance, and it's also very difficult for me to measure how much air resistance, so I hope you don't mind. I'm going to leave that out this time because it's quite small. Uh, any other forms of energy? Are there any springs for elastic energy? The answer is no. Is there any nuclear reactions going on? Obviously not. Are there chemical reactions going on? No. So these are the two kinds of energy that really matter the most, and we have done, we're done uh, adding up the totals for the initial side. Now, we then put them again on the final side, like this. And then what we do is we have to remember what we learned in the last video. EG is equal to mgh, and EK is equal to a half mv squared. So now we go and sub those in. EG initial will be mgh initial. EK initial will be a half mv initial squared. eg final will be mgh final and ek final will be one half mv final squared. Now a couple of nice things happen here. First of all ek initial is zero because the speed is zero and eg final is zero because we made that our reference point so the height is zero that goes away. That leaves me with mgh initial equals one half mv final squared. And now look what happens. We've got a common factor of m on both sides, so actually the mass cancels out. You don't even need to know the mass of this object to do the calculation. Uh, you may find that surprising until I remind you that in kinematics, when we did acceleration due to gravity and we calculated the motion of an object going through the air, you also didn't need to know the mass. In fact, we hadn't really talked much about mass when we did kinematics, so maybe it's not that surprising. Anyway, finishing up here, what do we get? Let's do a little bit of algebraic manipulation here. We want to find the speed at the bottom, so we're going to isolate V final, and we're going to get, let's see, 2gh initial square root. So 2gh initial. Uh, where am I here? Actually, there is no fraction there, so I can get rid of that line there. There we go, 2gh initial 
square rooted. I'm going to give myself a little bit more space here. And then we're going to finish this up. I can sub in the numbers. It's going to be the root of 2 times 9.8 times the 0 0.8. Remember, I moved the reference point, so that means not 1.8 here, but 0 0.8. And now I can take my calculator and do 2 times 9.8 times 0.8, and then take the square root of that number, and I get just under 4 meters per second. So to to two sig figs, four meters per second, which is uh, which is not overly fast, but it's also not that slow, especially when you have a 15 kilogram object moving. If that hits you, you're going to feel it. However, there you go. This is a calculation involving the law of conservation of energy and realizing that the total energy is conserved and having a few equations for the different kinds of energy, we can do a calculation, and it is quite simple. So. Make sure you remember how to do how to set this up. The most important part really is your very first line to write this and then to remember that total means adding up all the different kinds. If you remember this and you're good at identifying the different kinds of energy, then you're going to do just fine in this section. Let's move on. Here's a great example of the law of conservation of energy. Anyone who's been on a roller coaster has enjoyed the law of conservation of energy. Let me explain. Uh, on a roller coaster, usually what happens is the a train takes you, or a, a, a motor rather, and a chain takes you up to the top of the very first hill. You hear the clank clank of the chain as it's going up, and then here's the roller coaster car at the very top. You're not moving very fast at the top. Maybe your speed is something like, I don't know, let's say four meters per second just before you go over the edge. And then what happens is you go down, 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 and you pick up a lot of speed by the time you get down here. And then you go up again. Uh, this track probably comes around. Maybe it comes back around to here, and you end up on top of this hill over here. So what we might do is use the law of conservation of energy to calculate what would be the speeds at different places. Well, the first thing we would need to know is what are the heights? So suppose this height here, usually they're quite high. Maybe it'll be, uh, for a wooden roller coaster, actually not that high. Some of the, the steel ones are higher. Let's suppose this is 25 meters, which is in the 80-foot range. And then when you get to the bottom here, maybe you're only, I don't know, 5 meters above the ground. And then when you get back up here, you are maybe let's say 15 meters above the ground. Whatever the case may be, uh, we can label these points just to help keep things simple. This will be point A, this will be point B, and this is going to be point C right over here. And so what I'd like to do is, uh, is set up some of the calculations that you might do. For example, you might be asked in part A of a question, calculate the speed at point B, which is down here. So how would you go about doing this? Knowing that you were moving 4 meters per second at the top, 25 meters above the ground, how could you use the law of conservation of energy to get the speed down here? Well, if you think back to what we did in this question, we wrote the law of conservation of energy and then identified the different forms. So let's try that again. We write E total at a point where we know the information, like A, equals E total where we want to find out some information, like B. And then we identify the kinds of energy. Now there is clearly gravitational energy, just like there was in the last problem. And there's clearly kinetic energy, just like there was in the last problem. Now, on a roller coaster, there's also a lot of things like noise. And certainly, there's going to be significant air resistance because you get going pretty fast. You can feel the air going through your hair. Uh, what else is there going to be? There's probably going to be rubbing of the wheels against the track. So there will be additional friction. I'll write that down.
And uh, what else would there be? Well, uh, I don't know that there would be too many other forms of energy. Again, elastic energy, I don't really see any springs uh, at work here. Would there be a lot of chemical energy? No, believe it or not, once that motor brings you up the first hill, a roller coaster has no more motor pulling it, uh, except for some roller coasters. For example, the bat at Wonderland gets you going forward for half of the ride, and then a chain pulls you up a hill in the middle of the ride, and then you go backward. That chain is needed to pull you up that middle hill because you've lost some of your kinetic energy along the way due to friction. Uh, but most roller coasters just go on their own uh, during uh, the entire ride, and so there's no other motors, there's no chemical potential energy like with the burning of fuel. Uh, any other forms of energy? I don't really think so. You can uh, correct me in class if you can think of some, that would be great. But here's the thing we got to remember here. It's really hard to calculate how much noise energy is produced. Air resistance is also no easy task, and neither is friction with the track. So I'm going to neglect these, even though I really shouldn't. I'm going to neglect them now to keep things simple, even though that's really not a good idea. Now let me show you what I mean. We go over here, we continue with EG at point B and EK at point B. All right? And we write in what we know about these formulas. Okay. Uh, now, a couple of things. In this question here, I did something before I started the problem. I made the lowest point equal zero, the reference point, and that meant I had to change this height. Here, I, well, I'm going to pretend that I forgot to do that. The lowest point was 5 meters above the ground. The highest point was 25. If I wanted, I could have made this 0. So I'll put a 0 slash 5. And if that was the case, what would this become? This would become 20. And for that matter, the 15 would become 10. Well, guess what, folks? You actually don't have to do this. I'll, I'll give you a little exercise to try on your own. Try this problem without doing what I just did there, and then do it again with the zero point as the lowest. See whether you get the same answer for the speed at point B. You're going to find that you do, and therefore it's not essential that you make the lowest point zero, but it does come in handy because it makes one of these values zero. It would make mgh at B equal to zero if I had done this. But I'm not going to because I purposely forgot just to make a point to you. Let's see what you would do at this point. We've got m, 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 and m, all a common factor. Guess what? The mass cancels. I did not need to tell you the mass of the roller coaster. You can do this calculation. We've got 9.8 times the height at A, 25, plus a half of the speed at A, don't forget to square, equals, once again, 9.8 times the height at B, this time 5. Oops, that's a weird-looking 5 there. Try again. Plus a half of the V, the speed at B, squared. And now you can solve for the speed at point B. Again, try this with a 20 in there and a zero in here, you'll actually get the same answer. Uh, I haven't solved this for you. You can do it on your own. Make sure you get a speed that's higher than four. It would be kind of strange if the roller coaster actually slowed down as it went down the hill, or if its speed didn't change. All right. Now, let's actually get back to this problem of air resistance and friction. Like I said, noise is very difficult to calculate, but what if I asked you to make an estimate of the amount of work done by friction. How would you do this? Well, think for a moment. Friction is a force. We're dealing with the force of friction. And as the roller coaster car moves forward, so I'll draw that as a delta D vector in the forward direction, friction acts opposite. 
So what have we got here? We've got a force of friction and a displacement at work. Guess what? Just like we had in the past, work equals F cos theta delta D. So if I'm dealing with friction here, I'm going to write this. I'm going to write FF, whatever the force of friction may be. I'm going to write delta D, whatever that may be. But what am I going to put for theta? Delta D is forward. Friction acts backward. So that's a cos of 180. And so what happens when you get a cos 180? That means you have a negative 1. Now I've kind of run out of space here, so what I'm going to do is just move this over a bit. Hope you don't mind. And I'm going to continue writing down here. This is going to give me a force of friction times negative 1 times delta D, which is a negative FF delta D. Negative work is done by friction. And what have we seen in the past video that dealt with work? Negative work meant taking energy out of a system. In other words, actually taking away kinetic energy. So we can actually estimate the force of friction if we want to, and we could figure out how long the track is, it might be possible to estimate how much work is done by friction. Negative work, you're going to lose EK. Now if you lose EK and you can't get it back because friction is, that's like heat for example, you can't get that back very easily into the roller coaster, then what's that going to mean? It's going to mean that your roller coaster is going to slow down as it goes, and it won't be able to climb to a higher and higher hill as the ride progresses. That's why the highest hill in a roller coaster is the first hill, because afterwards you can't even make it back to the same height. In fact, if you go back and watch the video with the professor, you'll see that when the ball came back to its maximum position, maximum height, there was a greater distance in here than when he let go. When he let go, the ball was actually right at his chin. Due to the friction, that's why the ball didn't get back to the original. So you really do see friction at work here, and we know now how to calculate it. All right, let's move on. Here are some FET simulations that I'd like you to take a look at, which are definitely worth checking out. One of them deals with what we were just talking about. It's called Energy Skate Park. Let's have a look. So you're going to go to FET, you're going to go under physics, you're going to look for something called energy skate park, which I think is under work energy and power. When you get there, whoops, when you get there, you're going to download and then run this simulation. Here's what it looks like. It's fun to play with. Just as an introduction, you can start off with this guy here, who is a skater, who goes onto the track. And he goes up, and he goes down. You can alter his mass, although that isn't going to change anything, as we've seen. The mass does not matter, just like it didn't in the basic roller coaster problem or the basic pendulum problem. All right? Play around with this. When you want to start again, you just go return skater, or you reset all, and then you can start him at various different heights. Notice how if you start him here, this point here where my cursor is, he never returns to a higher point. He can't. He doesn't have enough kinetic energy. Now, this is kind of boring after a while, so let's go in and add friction. What would happen if we turned on friction and we move the slider, oops, if we move the slider a little bit higher, like to there? I want you to make a prediction about what you think will happen. If I start him near the top, make a prediction, pause the video, and then come back. Okay, you're back. Here we go. Let him go. Remember, he started here, but this time friction's acting. Look, he doesn't even get on the other side to the point that he got to when I started. This is like a roller coaster that, because it's converting the kinetic energy into thermal energy, the energy of friction, like when you rub your hands together, the rider never gets back to the original position, and eventually he stops. Same with a roller coaster, except for the bat that I mentioned at Wonderland, that one has a chain in the middle of the ride that pulls you back up, does more work, and allows you to resume the ride. An interesting thing to do here 
is to ask for a bar graph which shows the different energies. Try this. Move him up as high as you can and he gains potential energy on the graph. Because he's not moving, he has no kinetic energy. Because he has not encountered any friction yet, there's no thermal energy, so the total energy is all potential. And let go and watch what happens. As he goes, kinetic and potential, uh, they trade with one another. But the thermal energy keeps rising. The friction that is done never returns to the kinetic potential uh, back and forth that's going on here. Eventually, all the energy becomes thermal, and then the motion comes to a stop. So play around with this. It's a lot of fun. What you can do next is go to the track playground where you can click and drag track down here, and you can build different tracks. You can do whatever you want with this. See if you can get this guy to, to somehow uh, stay moving when there's friction. I don't know. See if you can violate the law of conservation of energy, or just design a really cool track. All right? That's a little fun for you to play around with. And here's another one, which is also in FET. Uh, sorry, you're going to go under this time. I believe you're going to find it under Work Energy and Power again. And it's called Masses and Springs. When you download it, it looks like this. You've got a bunch of masses that you can attach to a spring. And what I'm going to ask you to do is grab one of these. Let's say we grab the 100 gram mass. I'm going to attach it to this spring and let go and watch what happens. The mass starts oscillating up and down. You can do it in real time. This is what this would really look like in a classroom. Or you can slow it down at a quarter time. Or you can really slow it down at a sixteenth time. Or you can pause it. I like a quarter time. It's a good compromise. Now, the mass goes up and down and it keeps going up and down. If you leave this till tomorrow morning, it will still be going up and down. Uh, that's because there's no friction. So here's the friction slider that you can play with, but before we do that, let's look at the energies that are involved here. In order to do that, I am going to go to 16th time so that I can talk a little bit more. Um, the mass goes high. Let's pause it there. What energy do we have here? We're really high up in the problem. Pause the video and identify the main kind of energy. Okay, you're back, and what was that energy? It is gravitational. The mass is at the highest point. However, as we run the simulation, the mass falls down and it is now moving. So it has kinetic energy. It's also stretching the spring. So pause the video and see if you can think about the kind of energy that represents. All right, you're back. That energy is elastic potential energy. And of course, as we make it to the bottom, see if you can predict what's going to happen and then come back to the video. All right, you're back. Let's see what happens go to the bottom and we stop moving which means no kinetic energy but even more stretch of the spring so more elastic energy then the process reverses itself up we go gaining gravitational energy meanwhile we start to slow down so we lose kinetic and we also start decompressing the spring so we lose elastic energy if you want to see a similar graph to what we had in the previous uh, skate park question do this click on energy, show energy, and then run the simulation. Watch what happens. Kinetic energy changes as the speed changes. Gravitational energy becomes very low at the bottom and then goes back up at the top. Elastic energy increases as the spring stretches, but the total energy stays constant. Now let's pause this and see what happens if we introduce friction. Can you guess what's going to happen? Take a moment, pause the video, guess, and then come back. All right, here you're back. Let's take a look. If you guessed that the thermal energy, the friction, was going to start to increase, then you're right. You can see here the amount of friction is increasing, both in, an, in a sense of how much there is on its own and as a relative amount of the total energy. It's starting to take up more of the total energy, which means there is less energy available for other forms. Those other forms, such as kinetic, are going to mean that the object is going to eventually slow down. And if you leave this long enough, it will stop. You can see it's already slowing down. Leave this for a little bit longer or run it in real time. Watch the thermal energy rise. Notice the kinetic energy becoming less and less. 
and eventually we come to a stop. I'm going to leave that for you to finish off, but this is a fun simulation to see how energy uh, transfers in a spring. All right, and let's finish off now with something of extreme importance, actually. Uh, this is not so much important uh, in the sense of, hey, I want you to know it because it's really cool, but actually because it affects our future. It's the idea of how society meets its energy needs. We are a very energy-intensive society. We have fridges and heaters and air conditioners and lights and televisions and all sorts of electronic gadgets in our home. We drive our cars everywhere. We use a lot more energy per person than any other groups of people on Earth. That is uh, pretty much a fact. Maybe there's the odd country that is more energy intensive than Canadians and Americans, but we are up at the top for sure. How do we get our energy, and what does it have to do with the law of conservation of energy? Well, here's an image from your book, Physics 11 by Addison Wesley, and it shows what's called a fossil fuel or thermal generating station. Here's what happens. You take a fossil fuel, which might be, uh, it could be natural gas, it could be coal, uh, in some countries they even use oil and we burn it that creates a lot of heat that heat is used to boil water which is surrounding the heat source and that heat uh, that water actually becomes steam the steam then moves under high pressure to spin a turbine now where have we seen this before we've seen a water wheel as in a hydroelectric dam but this time we're using high pressure steam which also works quite well uh, that turbine is connected to an electric generator and from here on in the process is the same as the hydroelectric dam that you saw in the previous video. Cooling water is used usually from a lake for example and that causes the steam to condense back into liquid water and the cycle repeats. In the meantime air from outside which is allowing combustion to happen in the boiler here means there's going to be the, uh, the waste products of combustion, which of course you learned from earlier uh, years when you've studied science, when you burn fossil fuels, you get CO2 and you get some water, H2O. So what are we mostly concerned with? It's this. It's the CO2 that gets pumped into our atmosphere, and of course you know that that leads to global warming, which is certainly occurring. Anyone who tells you global warming is not occurring, you can immediately dismiss this person as either not knowing what he's talking about or trying to mislead you. Every scientist who is serious about this uh, and does not have a hidden agenda knows that global warming is occurring and virtually all of them will tell you that it is definitely due to human activity. I hope we're wrong but the evidence certainly does not suggest that's the case. Global warming is a fact and it seems like human beings are the main cause. Uh, we do this on a daily basis uh, a, a lot, We're pumping a lot of CO2 into the air, and of course all of the nations that are trying to uh, improve their standard of living, uh, I think of any nation around the world that used to be a third world country and is now industrializing, they are only adding to this. What does this mean for our future? Well, if the predictions about global warming and climate change are accurate, then it means we're going to see a lot more severe weather in the future, we could see droughts, we could see changing of the landscape, we could see rising sea levels as the polar ice caps melt. And the process, uh, I, I am sad to say, may actually be irreversible at this point. It may actually be too late at this point to do anything and avoid a catastrophe. But it also might not be. There might be something we don't know about the future and the way the planet works, and it may not be too late to uh, curb our input of CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the air. So we should certainly try because we don't want to give up on our planet. We have only one place to live, and it is here. So there are obviously environmental impacts that we have to consider. Uh, we also have to consider, though, our ability to meet electricity demand. There is a lot of natural gas in the ground, and there is a lot more coal in the ground, and there's still a fair amount of oil in the ground. Uh, as we speak, in Canada, there is quite possibly one of the world's largest oil deposits in what are called the tar sands uh, way out in Alberta. It is not easy to get this oil. It actually requires a lot of energy to get it out, but we are doing this out west. So look that up if you want to learn about <clears throat> how Canada is producing and exporting oil. That means there's economic impacts 
to what we decide to do with our electricity generation methods. Uh, and of course, the running of our economy depends on the, available, the availability of cheap energy. Right now, we pay very little for our energy compared to the damage that it might be doing to the environment. But as the uh, years go by, and as the rest of the world industrializes and puts demands on the natural resources on our planet, that, pr that price may actually go up. So here we're talking about how available are these resources, these fossil fuels. Well, these are all things that have to be considered, and I made this the fact of the video because it's so important to our future, more your future than mine, because I've got a few years on you guys, but you should definitely be thinking about this. Uh, what can we do to avoid a climate catastrophe and a possible uh, squeeze on our demand for, uh, for or the availability of resources as other countries compete for what is available out there. Well, we could switch to other forms. There are, of course, nuclear energy, and of course, there's hydroelectric, and uh, of course, there's also solar, and there's even wind, and there are some others as well. Uh, there are pros and cons to all of these, and in this chapter of your textbook, 5.4, you can read about them, and I certainly encourage you to do so. Uh, I envision a future for myself and for you guys where we have challenges, but maybe some of you are going to be the people who start looking into this now uh, at your age, you're 16 or 17 or maybe 18. That means you are in a position where you could actually be someone who comes up with a solution to some of these problems and maybe that will save our planet from catastrophe or maybe you'll find a way to to make this situation livable maybe we'll find a way to remove co2 from the atmosphere in a way that is uh, economical and feasible i don't know i certainly hope that some of you get interested in this and don't get too depressed uh, we have to have hope we have to make sure that we think about solutions it is certainly not realistic to expect everyone to stop burning fossil fuels so we need a solution that works. Anyway, that is where I'm going to leave you. The fact of the video then, well, let's call it facts of the video. Make sure you're able to discuss what I just discussed with you on this uh, slide here. It's of extreme importance, maybe the most important message of the entire course. And with that, I leave you to go do some problems now. All right, sorry for the long video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. I will see you in class.